It is a great honor for me to coordinate the fifth session of our conference on the subject towards a predictable and sustainable healthcare system, bold solutions for the future. Allow me a very brief introductory intervention. It is in the use of the word bold, a very challenging and excellent choice of term. And I would like to point out the following. Knowing and seeing uh, the speakers that are to follow, I can assure you that the solutions will be rational, necessary, and uh, modern. Whatever we are to listen from, from the representatives of the state uh, here in this panel, and important representatives of uh, biomedical uh, technology. I want to thank uh, the organizers for bestowing this honor to moderate this panel. And we start with the first speech of the Deputy Minister of uh, Digital Governance, Mr. George Jurgantas. You have the floor. Good morning. Madam Yitona, allow me to mention beforehand that it, it, it is not about bold solutions. They are necessary solutions. And this we have all realized, I believe. Let me first thank the President of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Nikos Pakatsellos, and the President of uh, uh, SFER, Mr. Apostolidis, the head that is the President of the Association of Pharmaceutical Companies. Challenges such as population aging, increase of chronic diseases, the ever-increasing needs of patients, and unexpected crises such as the latest pandemic really test uh, the resilience of the healthcare system. Digital transformation can bring about to the healthcare sector whatever it has brought about in all other public services, a radical change in the way citizens serve are served in their needs, a change of paradigm in the way the state perceives its responsibility vis-a-vis -vis its citizens. Digital transition constitutes a very uh, strong toolkit which is being uh, exploited with a view to serving all citizens indiscriminately, sets the citizen at the center, adding value in the relationship of state-citizen. The health crisis gave a great boost to the digital state. Now it is a digital state that will boost the improvement of the healthcare system. Our goal is the way government handled the vaccination program to be the onset of a radically different form of structure and implementation of public policies on health. So as for not, that not to be a, a mere um, firework, but the onset of a real transformation. From the onset of the pandemic, the Ministry of Digital Governance and Health were on daily co close cooperation, accelerating a planning that already existed before the pandemic. The first step, almost at the onset of the crisis, it was the full implementation of e-prescription. The government gave the possibility to whomever citizen uh, wanted that to receive through email or SMS to receive his prescription, thus uh, contributing both to servicing the citizen but also rationalizing the pharmaceutical expenditure. Within the next months, the same uh, procedure was applied for procedures, for referrals. Therefore, a large chunk uh, that was the reason for visits uh, in private uh, practices or in hospitals were extinguished, thus limiting the chances for the vaccine, for the virus dispersion. Therefore, through COVID.gr, more than 2.5 million citizens enrolled in e-prescription system. Last month, we announced in cooperation with Evica two new actions. First, the medical certificates to be also received through SMS or email so as to be used for sports or any other activity. What was determining, however, was the activation of My Health app. 
As you know, this is an application that allows to those that uh, uh, install it on their mobile phones to have access to all e-prescriptions, referrals, and medical certificates that are issued in their number, in their registry. This uh, is valid for the onset of uh, the social of the date of social uh, of the inscription of the enrollment in the social security system, and these first steps actually are the foundation for the creation of the electronic uh, record health record. But we don't limit ourselves there. Let us not forget that all these uh, rampant digital uh, changes in combination with the maturity of population have brought about important differences in the aspirations of the citizens vis-a-vis -vis, uh, disease prevention. Citizens are not only ready, but actually desire uh, the digital medical services. Therefore, our goal is to empower every single citizen, supporting specially sensitive groups, such as chronic patients, senior citizens, and those having uh, mobility problems, thus uh, offering the capacity of uh, easy and uh, quick communication through the network with professionals. Additionally, the expansion of digital services in the health sector will fight bureaucracy, the redundant uh, transports, the carrying around of uh, documents, and also fight corruption and uh, offer a lot to the, to the transparency. An important uh, benefit will be through the development of the necessary actions and the development of telemedicine network. We will explore the current. Uh, we will explore. We will explore the system for the home care, for medical uh, acts, and so forth, as well as redesigning processes so as to have uh, reimbursement. Also, in the case of uh, remote medical services offered, through this uh, quantifiable. Uh, projects that we will be implemented through the RFRF we will upgrade uh, the medical services at the points through the upgrading of uh, the mature digital services, securing the privacy and uh, protection of uh, medical data, the improvement uh, of also and training of all partners in uh, IT and promoting entrepreneurship in electronic health through the introduction of new innovative technologies in the national health system. An important mechanism is the turn towards the an organization of the health system so as to deal with long-term deficiencies. Those actions will be intensified and further explored so as for the health services and care services to become more resilient, accessible, and effective for the citizens. I am certain that uh, the conditions are mature. There is also a common will, uh, a common pace. There are the available financial instruments, and it is indeed a great opportunity so as for medical services start a brand new era. This goal is served by all, I believe. It is a reality which is close. It's no longer sci-fi. It is something that has started being implemented, and I see through our role is to embrace it and expand it. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much. Mr. George Yorgantas for respecting the time and for presenting all the fields of digital transformation in our country. And of course, we should all acknowledge the efforts made by this government in this direction. And now we'd like to give the floor to the next speaker, 
since we cannot talk about digitalization without talking about provision of information and communication on the part of the state, of course. That is why I now would like to give the floor to Mr. Yanis Mastrogeorgiou in order to give his presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to thank the organizers of the conference. I would also like to thank uh, the technical team that uh, provides us with all necessary support and help uh, since uh, we have this uh, communication from a distance. Ms. Gitona, today I'm not going to talk uh, on the capacity of uh, the General Secretary of Communication and Media. On the contrary, I'm going to talk uh, as a head of the Foresight uh, Group because I believe that uh, it will be more interesting since I'm addressing to people who understand the future developments uh, and uh, the reforms that will take place in the field of health. You know, it is one of the very few times that we have the possibility to read to approach the mega trends of the future, the different black circles, as they are called, and all the developments that will be brought about by the future. And it is also one of the very few times that we are able to shape our own view for the future, because this is exactly the task of foresight in cooperation with the European Commission, with the OECD and other international organizations. So my main objective is to talk about an extremely important change that has already been made in the health sector during the pandemic and will be, in our view, and of course based on all the existing trends and studies that have been conducted, uh, very, very important in the coming years. The health sector, and not only, <coughs> will be characterized by radical and uh, revolutionary changes uh, that will provide uh, major opportunities for the development of R&D and for the improvement of services provided to the citizens. All these changes will be far more compared to the changes that have taken place in the last 100 years. We could also say that we are lucky, quote unquote, because we are going through a period that is called the uh, Anthropocene. We are living in a period in which uh, humans have affected so much uh, their evolution and also the state of the planet that they have uh, defined a completely new era by themselves, humans. And this new era is here and will develop rapidly in the coming years with the utilization of technology, but also with the use of biology and biotechnology. All the ecosystem of the developments that we will witness in the future, first and foremost, of course, climate change. I'm not, something, I'm not telling something new. I know that I'm addressing people who have a deep knowledge of uh, the current state of affairs and what uh, climate change means. So all of these developments will influence man and health. I will give you one example that you probably already know. The melting of the ice in the coming years, and especially the melting of the ice that is in a frozen state for thousands of years, will release in the atmosphere microbes, viruses, and bacteria that have been forgotten. We don't know whether humans are ready to deal with a new pandemic coming from the Paleolithic age. Of course, this will influence the sector of health. I don't want to say things that you already know with regard to the development of technology. Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Google, all these big companies will be the partners, uh, the collaborators uh, of uh, the major players in the health sector. They will be the partners of health companies and health industry in general in the future. We will be faced with the developments and changes like remote monitoring, like cloud computing, machine learning. We will be able to create in our own home an 
at-home medical center, we will be able to use on a daily basis equipment in our bathroom that will perform all the tests. For example, we will have the smart mirror who will perform that will perform all the tests. In addition, we will have technologies that will be able to scan and not only record, this is already done today by a phone. So these devices will scan, record and will take a step further thanks to technology. Of course, uh, telemedicine will be an integral part uh, of uh, the health sector in the future. And uh, last but not least, uh, synthetic biology will be a major development. This will give us the possibility to alter the software, if you like, of our own self. And this will raise many questions uh, with regard to ethics, businesses, companies, and generally speaking, the health sector will have to be quite updated and informed about all these issues related to ethics. And this, of course, will be a major opportunity for cooperation between organizations like European Commission, international organizations, and different states, so as to come up with a different framework for the management of these radical developments that will inevitably come in the future. I don't want to take uh, more of your time. However, I would like to tell you that uh, the opportunities uh, that will emerge uh, for the health sector in the future will be many, both at the level of research and development, at European and international level, but also at many other levels. I would like to give you now the results of a report in which we took part in collaboration with OECD and which had to do with the dependence of Europe on uh, raw materials and products, especially in the pharmaceutical sector. The dependence is enormous and we need to see as Europe how we will become st strategically autonomous. You know, the European Commission imports approximately 5,600 uh, SKUs. Out of these, the products that pertain to health, electronic systems, energy and defense, are 137. 14 out of these 137 uh, products of strategic importance uh, have to do with the health sector. The point is that our dependence as European Union is mainly on China, India, and these two countries are now going uh, through a period of uh, development and of a uh, deep shift when it comes to chemical products, which means that we will see some important changes in the future. There are going to be many opportunities for the European Union and for the health sector in the coming 10 years, and I'm saying that with as much certainty as I can have, since nobody can uh, actually predict the future, we are the ones who shape the future. So I believe that in the coming 10 years, the revolution of biotechnology, of uh, medicines and of the health sector will be in the spotlight and it will be a major opportunity for the state, but also for the companies to revisit the way in which man deals with health and generally with the ecosystem of healthcare and protection. Thank you very much. We warmly thank Mr. Master Yu. I knew what you were to say. I was informed, but I wanted you to launch the discussion. But I would like to add for the audience sake that this is a most important uh, instrument, Innovation Fund, and it cooperates with international financial institution, institutions beyond the e -com European Commission on climate change, uh, sustainable uh, development, uh, IES, uh, add, adding jobs. But I found it in a project on the contribution 
of health technology innovation, and I found it while working on the fine on the funding that was available on COVID, where again many resources uh, are available for the exploitation of research and a lot of other subjects. You know it very well, but I merely wanted to point that out. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. So we proceed with the representatives of the pharma industry. I give the floor right away to the dear uh, Mr. Paschalis Apostolidis, who is president of Pharmaceutical Companies Committee of the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce and member of the board at SFAIR and uh, BIF. Madam Yitona, along with my good morning, allow me a brief comment. I could not agree more with what has been said by both the Minister, Mr. Georgiadas, and the Secretary General, Mr. Mastro Georgiou. And I consider it common ground because you have uh, in front of you the representatives from the whole pharma industry and the industrial plants, I believe that the common goal of all is for the conclusions, the conclusions that are to be drawn from this roundtable. And now I come to the gist of my presentation. During my, fir my first uh, yesterday's address, uh, I gave a picture of the future. I tried to give a picture that could be shaped uh, in the national health system 10 years from today. This uh, might have sound perhaps utopia and too optimistic. Nevertheless, nothing is unfeasible. Everything can be done if we are persistent on the goal and if we plan carefully where we want to go and what will be the path to follow. Anyway, yesterday's uh, introductory presence of my presentation of mine is not a, a merely wishful thinking, but depends on today's political decisions. And that was precisely described by the two previous speakers. I believe, therefore, that today's decisions will shape the future, and it is now the last opportunity to solve the problems of the past. Allow me to explain how we can, within 10 years, in a totally and radically different reality in the field of pharma, to have this new reality. Let me say indicatively the following. Let me show you the first slide, and the only slide, actually. Direct access of patients to innovation. COVID-19 pandemic definitely demonstrated the importance of pharma innovation and the necessity of direct access of patients to it. It was it became absolutely clear that if something is really innovative, this must move ahead as quickly as possible, both with regard to the approval, uh, approval procedures and the access to the general population. The measures that have to be taken is the creation of the you know, pharmaceutical innovation fund. This new fund will be a new crystal clear mechanism on specific cost that will secure the direct access of patients to innovative drugs. Establishing the price list every two months, promotion of the cooperation of UNETA that we will have the clinical assessment role at European level and the European HDA and the analysis, cost analysis in the national budget, setting specific and very strict timetable of approval of new drugs following the approval by the European Pharma Agency. Allow me a, a comment here. Yesterday, it was uh, the day of uh, mourning uh, with the loss of an eminent uh, woman, the only uh, woman heading a political party. Along with her, millions of uh, women's lives uh, are lost to breast cancer. So we must see what is the importance of innovation that all these uh, companies present on this table have invested in. Cancer will be curable in many years, in some years, in most forms. And the last castle that was the unsolved puzzle, which was dementia and Alzheimer, as we recently learned, also starts being corroded. So we are at the ultimate stage of winning the last battle. 
Uh, another issue, extinction of clawback through the cooperation of the state and the industry will lay the foundations and the timetable for mutual uh, reforms uh, and concessions that we will help uh, in rationalizing the expenditure. The patient's registries, the therapeutic protocols, the electronic uh, medical record, all this will contribute in uh, setting the real needs and avoiding the non-necessary expenditure. The implementation of those important uh, reforms has to be accelerated through funds of the RRF as well. Third, rationalizing public funding. On the subject of extinguishing clawback, this also has to do with rationalizing the real needs of funding. First, we should, through the assistance of the instruments I mentioned, we must identify the real needs of the system. Then we must find solutions on expenditure that burden excessively the system and could find other resources. The exemption of the vaccines is a characteristic example. Similarly, we should seek a solution for the expenditure of the non-insured persons, which will reach 310 million euros for 2021. The third uh, constituent would be the funding of the real needs. So the overall viewpoint of the state should change so as for health not to be a cost center, but as a prerequisite for social and uh, economic prosperity, as it has been proven by the pandemic of the last two years. Fourth transformation of Greece as a world excellence uh, center for clinical trials and R&D. We must promote clinical trials and solve the issues of bureaucracy at regional, but mainly at the hospital level. Um, specific incentives introduced for attracting investments, increase of the existing uh, incentives, such as the offset of Klobach, and uh, uh, establishing an agency that will uh, be responsible for the coordination of hospitals and will be operating as a one-stop shop. And also following the approval of a drug from the European uh, Pharma Agency should be approved within two months in Greece, as, in Greece as well and be launched in the market. And finally, the transformation of Greece in a world uh, um, excellence center of uh, real evidence, real world evidence. We have a comparative advantage. The data which was the omen of what you mentioned uh, previously are the scientific data were necessary. As you know, hundreds of millions of euros are spent every single day in order to have access to processing real data. Greece ha ha can have a great share of this pie, starting with an opening of the data that we collect, of course, uh, by strict observation of GDPR, and then proceed with synergies of public and private sector, of companies here present, and uh, research centers. Of course, it is critical to seek for European funds as well. In conclusion, I, w I wanted to tell you that I tried to make clear that there are specific proposals, a specific plan for their implementation. So let us stop discussing on theory on what we would wish to see. Let us focus on how we will attain that. It is high time we changed mentality. And it is high time we stopped uh, offering lip service and start the action. Let us proceed to the necessary changes for a very strong and sustainable health system to the benefit of the citizens, the state, and Greek economy. Let us create today the future we want precisely as we want to shape it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Apostolidis, for your presentation and for making realistic proposals. I'm not going to repeat them. We will give the floor to the representatives of the different institutions. And if we have time left at the end, then maybe we can have a, a discussion on your proposals. So now I would like to give the floor directly to Mr. Olympios Papadimitriou, who is president of the Hellenic Association of Pharmaceutical Industries. Mr. Papadimitriou, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Gitona. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, the organizers of the conference of the American Hellenic Chamber, for inviting me to this conference. It's a great honor to be here today among representatives of the state and of the pharmaceutical industry in order to talk about the possible solutions for a sustainable future. I would like to spend some time on making certain verifications and on presenting you with some data because, uh, to be honest, the actions of the past will define the boldness of our future actions and moves. I cannot possibly think that our future actions will be dramatically different and revolutionarily different compared to the ones of the past. So if you could please show the slides. Thank you very much. The previous speakers said that the expenditure on health in the future will have to increase according to estimates that had been made before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. The expenditure in the years 2018 to 2022 should have to increase by 55.4%, whereas in terms of GDP should be equal to 10.5%. The reasons why this increase should take place are obvious. First of all, the chronic diseases, the aging of the population, and of course, uh, the storm of innovation that emerges from the pharmaceutical industry and which uh, can offer wonderful solutions uh, for many health problems. Are we close to all these as Greece? I'm afraid not. And I would like to touch upon a rather harsh indicator that shows the health state of a population. And it has to do with life expectancy. You know that the coronavirus pandemic uh, has led to a drop of life expectancy all around the world. However, if one focuses on the dark black line, which is Greece, will verify that this uh, drop of the life expectancy has started earlier than the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. And I would say that uh, we shouldn't expect uh, an increase of life expectancy in the future. We are a country that is faced with of the ischemic cardiac disease, cancer, strokes. We are champions in obesity, in smoking. At the same time, we have an aging population. We have an epidemiological profile that uh, it is rather dark and uh, does not bode well for the future. So the answer to all these, and especially due to the financial crisis of the past, has been a low financing of the healthcare system. Almost 7.5% of GDP are spent on health, but it seems that we are far lower compared to the European average when it comes to the financing of the healthcare system. I would like to touch upon this slide. Allow me to say, however, first, that during the last 10 years, and unfortunately this year we are on the 10th year of clawback, the sector has contributed approximately 11 billion euros, has returned, if you like, 11 billion euros to the state, covering in that way the weakness of the state in covering the health needs. However, what is uh, most concerning when you're seeing these slides uh, is this increasing trend. Basically, the state, for various different reasons, which shouldn't exist, has uh, become complacent uh, because of clawback. And of course, we should accept that this is not sustainable. That is why we have repeatedly identified the risk that is linked with clawback when it comes to the sustainability of the health system. This was also underlined yesterday by a representative of the European Commission. So, 
when it comes to the future, we need to focus on four different areas. First of all, we need to rationalize demand and offer supply. That is, uh, we need to promote innovation and, of course, we need to promote the effective monitoring of the system. That is why, as an association of pharmaceutical industries of Greece, we have submitted a series of proposals that are based on seven pillars, which are known to most of us. However, apart from the financing of the system, which is undoubtedly an imperative need, we are far from the European average in terms of the financing, as I said. So apart from that, And as the minister said, uh, there are various different things that are taking place and they are truly important. However, one of the most important factors is the digitalization of the health system, which will facilitate the provision of services to the citizens, but at the same time will become a means of recording of our successes in terms of the use of financing. At the same time, it will become a control mechanism that will allow us uh, to identify sources of uh, overspending. Now, with regard to the developmental prospect uh, of the sector, I believe that the pharmaceutical sector, despite the constant financial pressure it is under for the last few years, always find a way to release the pressure. And that is why it is now turning to developmental uh, sectors and it is also perceived as a developmental sector. What we have tried to do and we have succeeded is attract clinical trials in Greece. And I believe that this uh, effort has been uh, recognized by the Greek government and that is why lately they have um, combined clawback with research and development. So now, as a pharmaceutical association, we have uh, conducted a survey with the EWC and we have uh, concluded in these uh, four sectors uh, that will allow us to attract more clinical trials in the country. I don't have much time, so I'm not going to present this in detail. However, I want to show you this slide, which shows that the center of our effort is the patient. Our objective is to develop a sustainable system that will guarantee the equal access for all, and at the same time will guarantee a good quality of care. Better health equals stronger economy. But if we want to gaze the future, we need to focus on the present because those who are very forward-looking are at risk of stumbling today. We warmly thank Mr. Papadimitriou. Some references vis-à-vis -vis the proposals were common. What should be pointed out, however, is the reduction, as Mr. Apostolidis, extinction, said Mr. Papadimitriou, abolition for us scientists of the clawback, 11 billion euros of funding the health system. Without reflecting the needs of the population, This I have to stress from the old speech. And I continue with the next speaker, Mr. Theodore Trifon, who is president of the Panhellenic Union of Pharmaceutical Industries. Mr. Trifon, you have the floor. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Gitonas. I thank both the president and the organizing committee and the head of the committee, Mr. Apostolidis, for the invitation. I believe that uh, it has been uh, reiterated uh, ad nauseum, the problems vis-à-vis -vis the coverage of the patient's needs and the sub-funding and the reduction of the investment uh, funds, all that caused by clawback, which is so high only in Greece. I don't want to dwell anymore on that. I would like to set the overall framework and say the following. Even with a delay, even if it is thanks to to the pandemic, the debate uh, on the European uh, Union in the European Commission was launched on the day after on how we can best serve the European citizen vis-a-vis -vis crisis. And I believe we have all agreed that whenever it is possible, we must uh, minimize the dependency on raw materials and ready products from third countries. 
we saw during the pandemic that this was the most critical problem, and it is not by chance that this is the result of this disinvestment that has taken place in the field of the pharma industry due to the sub-funding in Europe. And this has happened over the last 15-20 years. So here lies a huge challenge for Europe and even greater for Greece. Greece has gone through not solely from a pandemic, but also following a a uh, 10-year of MOUs, so it is crystal clear what the questions and dilemmas are set for the day after. The pandemic has uh, transformed the agenda, and this is a unique opportunity to participate with more specific proposals uh, in the dialogue about the day after. It is clear that we are also in front uh, of a change, both of the European pharma policy and the review both of strategy and legislation. We, there are issues such as funding on the table. The recovery facility is one first launching point on how we can serve the patient's needs and the use of technology through a system and funds that were unprecedented in the past. A second uh, branch is how procurement, how the overall procedure of pharma procurement can be as more rational as possible in the European Union. And there are two categories of uh, drugs, the innovative, as we had now the vaccination and the medicines against COVID. The utility of innovative drugs and the very high cost have set very different difficult uh, financial situations, and also the medicines of patent, which are currently delivered by 400 plants of generics in the European Union, and 70% of the medicines covering European and Greek citizens. Therefore, the procu through procurement system, new procurement system, through off-patent uh, generic levy drugs and innovative drugs are the three constituents. Through the development of incentives for the production in European so on European soil, equally important debate that is launched, our country participates through the contribution and participation of PEF and myself in my capacity as president of Bahrain Union of Pharmaceutical Industries, we have a comparative disadvantage in comparison to other sectors and other countries where there is protectionism. And the European industry has to cover a lot of regulatory costs. And all these costs uh, make us less competitive. So incentives must be offered in order to do away with all those counter incentives. And a point is how we will uh, increase and uh, intensify R&D in Europe. And of course, the issue of institutional reforms. A part of all these concerns is in included in the RRF, the Greek RRF, is related both with reforms and uh, uh, mitigation of clawback. For me, it's extremely positive that within this extremely negative financial environment, it's for the first time that we have some positive signs from 2019 with 80% of 8% offset for investments and for the first time also the acknowledgement of co-responsibility on pharmaceutical expenditure from the state and the uh, industry. That is, if we exceed a certain ceiling in pharmaceutical expenditure, the state assumes the responsibility to cover the remaining that uh, additional expenditure. So we must rationalize the clawback to see how we'll have a rational funding and see how Greece will become a technological hub. We see a lot of investments, how it can become a technological hub for Southeastern Europe. So R&D, innovation, and productive 
gap that has to be covered. It's extremely positive that even with a small incentive of 50 or 100 million euros per year, we have direct investments of more than 1 billion euros over the next five-year horizon from Greek industries and even more so from multinationals. So this is the framework that we must explore for the next five years, how we can substantially elaborate the agenda open from the European Commission on funding, uh, on resilience and supply on European soil, on R&D and incentives for investments, for employment and for brain gain, not solely in Greece, but the whole of Europe, how we can best exploit that. I consider that we, uh, this uh, opportunity exists through cooperation with the state, in cooperation with the universities for R&D, to be able over the next years to do away with uh, the problems that were caused uh, and the rigidities uh, that were imposed of the subfunding due to the subfunding of the health system during the previous years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Trifon, for conveying an optimistic message to the audience. We need such a message, and especially with regard to the positive impact of the pandemic. The pandemic provided us with some opportunities that have to do with reforms, revisions of the pharmaceutical policy, of the policy pertaining to the use of medical technology, revision of the procurement policy and others. Thank you very much, Mr. Trifon. Now I would like to give the floor to the president of the Pharma Innovation Forum Greece, Ms. Agata Jakovic. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ, κυρία Γιτόνα. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ, κυρία Αποστολίδη, για την πρόσκληση που μου απευθύνατε και σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ το Αμερικανικό Ελληνικό Επιμελητήριο για τη διοργάνωση αυτού του πάρα πολύ σημαντικού συνεδρίου που μας δίνει την ευκαιρία να συζητήσουμε για την φαρμακοβιομηχανία και για την βιωσιμότητα του συστήματος υγείας. Αυτό που θα ήθελα να συζητήσω στα επόμενα έξι λεπτά είναι η βιωσιμότητα από την πλευρά της φαρμακοβιομηχανίας. Όπως μπορείτε να δείτε σε αυτή τη διαφάνεια και πιστεύω ότι την έχετε δει αυτή τη διαφάνεια ήδη. Πρώτον, βλέπουμε ότι η συνεισφορά της φαρμακοβιομηχανίας είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντική. Είναι ουσιαστικά ένα πάρα πολύ σημαντικό χρηματοδότηση που εγγυάται την βιωσιμότητα του φαρμακευτικού τομέα στην Ελλάδα. Όπως μπορείτε να δείτε εδώ στη διαφάνεια, η μεγαλύτερη συνεισφορά που έχει γίνει από τον φαρμακομηχανικό τομέα είναι προς τα νοσοκομεία και αποδεικνύει τη σπουδαιότητα του τομέα αυτού. Δεύτερον και πολύ σημαντικό συμπέρασμα αν δείτε την διαφάνεια. Αν δείτε την περίοδο από το 2014 η δημόσια συνεισφορά είναι πάνω κάτω flat, η ίδια. Και πραγματικό είναι ότι δεν έχει γίνει εντοπισμό των αναγκών των ασθενών ή των διαφόρων θεραπείων που προσφέρονται ανακατηγορία. Άρα βλέπουμε αυτά τα δύο πολύ σημαντικά συμπεράσματα σε αυτή τη διαφάνεια. Προφανώς λοιπόν η φαρμακοβιομηχανία συμβάλλει σημαντικά στη χρηματοδότηση του συστήματος και δεύτερον, για να το επαναλάβω, η χρηματοδότηση αυτή βρίσκεται στα επίπεδα του 2014. Άρα, μπορείτε να φανταστείτε ότι θα μπορούσαν να ήταν πολύ διαφορετικά τα πράγματα, δεδομένου ότι μιλάμε για μία χρονιά πριν από έξι χρόνια. Συνήθως λέμε, εντάξει, οκ. Okay. Αλλά να δούμε όμως ποιος είναι ο πραγματικός αντίκτυπος αυτού του γεγονότος στην υγεία του ελληνικού πληθυσμού. Όπως βλέπουμε σε αυτήν τη διαφάνεια, και πιστεύω ότι και άλλοι έχουν χρησιμοποιήσει την ίδια διαφάνεια, αυτή είναι η κατάσταση υγείας όπως προκύπτει από μία έκθεση του ΟΑΣΑ. Εδώ πέρα βλέπουμε ότι το προσδόκιμο ζωής της Ελλάδας 
έχει αυξηθεί με τον πιο αργό ρυθμό σε σχέση με τα υπόλοιπα μέλη της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης. Αλλά αυτό που είναι πιο σημαντικό ακόμα είναι ότι η θνητότητα των βρεφών έχει αναστραφεί τα τελευταία χρόνια. Let me point out two subjects that she touched upon. 
and most important, the contribution of a pharma industry in funding the health system and the lack of uh, public uh, health expenditure in our country with negative, of course, impact on the epidemiological indices that were presented. I do not reiterate that. Therefore, the stability at very low levels in uh, consecutive years uh, with regard uh, as far as public health expenditure is concerned has direct impact on uh, the drop of investments in pharma innovation and in extenso the negative impact and non-existence of incentives for investments in R&D. We warmly thank, uh, we warmly thank uh, uh, Madam Jankovic, uh, the president of pharma, and let us move ahead with Mr. Dimitris Nikas and wish him the best since he is his name day today who is president of the Association of Health Research and Biotechnology Industry. So let us listen to the other respective uh, uh, stakeholders in our country. Thank you. I thank the organizers for the invitation. I would like to start uh, making a proposal, uh, hearing how you view the future and how the health systems will be developing from now on, instead of speaking of industries, uh, of pharmaceutical industries and uh, industry of technology. Let us speak of health industry at large. This is a term that must be coined and used from now on. In my presentation, I would like to start with the role they have played and to what extent the companies were ready so as to deal with the crisis. I would say that uh, we rank quite well because we responded quickly, both through the tests uh, that we have introduced, launched in the market, and the availability we had in support uh, equipment and machinery, such as uh, ventilators, even the protection gear, that is the masks uh, and uh, gloves, are also integrated in this broad spectrum of technology. And these were promptly available to all the hospitals of the country. Additionally, we imported very quickly new applications that could follow and monitor remotely the patient and assist the, the physician. The physician could monitor the patient remotely without having to pay visits to the hospitals. And finally, we had a great sufficiency of both personnel and material. One of the lessons, therefore, we must all draw from this crisis, and we saw it uh, obviously appearing, is that we perhaps could not respond to the demand because there was a multiple demand and on many occasions, there was the same demand on different suppliers. And though it seems that one, they might ask uh, uh, 100 was uh, desired, but actually the real need and demand was for 50. So we must see more coordinated our procurement system through cooperations between states, through the storage uh, depot venues or whatever. As I said, the medical technology companies are more than 500,000, have more than 500,000 applications in hospitals, in households, or in primary care practices. And there are more than 14.5 thousand patents in such products, most patents than any other sector of industry. This means that this is a, an innovative uh, uh, sector by default. It allows, of course, for uh, life expectancy and improvement of life quality and contributes uh, in uh, saving uh, resources and systems in health. The basic principle, one of the 20 basic principles of the pillars of the European Commission on Social Cohesion is that each person has uh, the right of timely access to an, um, an uh, had, um, um, has the right of timely access to an uh, available good quality preventive therapeutic uh, health care and uh, 
affordable one furthermore. So we must take into consideration that. And I believe sometimes when we were through the crisis, we forget that. And we go back to what we used to do in the past and speak again about funding and clawback and things that have already been stated, but actually that was the agenda before the crisis. After the crisis, uh, having gone through COVID uh, turmoil, we must review the approach we have towards the subjects. And let me refer to four proposals on which we should focus, to my view. It is a unique opportunity currently where to uh, implement, that we have uh, implemented already digital solutions to help IT so as to transform and improve our services, the care that is the health care offered to the patients that need it. Therefore, maintaining an exploitation of digital health measures, the minister mentioned that there are a lot of solutions, yes, but they must continue being implemented directly. Now, data, health data, you know that you don't record many things. We should start doing so. Otherwise, how can, can we make decisions for the future? And of course, incentives must be offered for the reward, for the payment of the digital health services offered. And AI is here. There are already applications used, and there will be even more so in the future. When we speak of uh, added value of health, serv or health technologies, we should bear in mind that what should be done, this had, has to be done in full scale, and it should be assessed according to the results, not solely on the basis of their price. We should not uh, take a snapshot of what this specific technology offers and assess it. We must see it through its whole life cycle, from the start and the end, and after the treatment is offered to the patient, and approach also new financial instruments that are not currently available, a new procurement system, which should be based on the value-based best care and not on the price of paying for the materials. Two more issues. We should enhance uh, the innovative uh, commodities and services in the field of, care, of health, and we must really do away with red tape. You know that this is a loop. This is a kind of strangling many companies that would like to invest in the health sector, but due to the huge bureaucratic cost, they do not dare to do so. Or postpone it for later. And finally, we should speak about the improvement of the interoperability of the system, so as for the collection, processing, and exchange of quality data and health indices, boost uh, training in the field of health, uh, help uh, for help the, the, the patients, and also the, the decision makers. I'd like to conclude saying that COVID was a crisis, still is. I believe, however, that it can be seen as a huge opportunity for many things to be changed in the health system, which we, may, we are faced with on a daily basis, and we are perhaps um, disappointed because we don't see ideas being implemented. But now we see a lot of things that can become a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nikas, for observing the time. You were the last speaker. What I would like to underscore is the important contribution of your sector vis-a-vis -vis the sufficiency of materials, of uh, supplies, everything during the pandemic even from the outbreak, the first outbreak uh, of uh, the pandemic. This was most important. And as far as the proposals are concerned, digitization, as it was uh, reiterated by all, what you have uh, separately contributed, and we know it, but must be always stressed, is the exploitation, creating data, therefore recording data, processing uh, of that data with the upgrading of the system and the upgrading of HDA.
it is something that we say a lot. And let me conclude by commenting with what you said at the beginning of your speech, that we should use the term assessment of health technology. I said that right from the beginning as I took the floor, that we have representatives of, of the field of medical technology besides politicians. I totally agree with the use of this term. I warmly thank you all as well as the audience. I thank all the panelists and the audience, and I think that we should uh, pass the torch, give the floor for a Q&A session. No, Madam Yitona. No, I merely wanted to point out something, if you allow me. It was heard from uh, the discussion, it's very important, the fact that in the restructuring program we saw for the first time a model of co-responsibility between the industry and the state vis-a-vis -vis the clawback. And this is, uh, we really encourage it and we salute it because that was also the result of our efforts to make, that we made consistent efforts to make the state realize that this model was not sustainable. Nevertheless, we lately see a trend for negotiations of various categories of drugs separately. This is not bad per se, but when in the framework of negotiations, you, they also include the clawback, that is, we are asked to a front load, a front load of payment of the clawback, and in a way, if you allow the populistic expression to, to cover it, to hide it, I must make that clear. The allocation of responsibilities in the framework uh, of restructuring in the RRF mechanism will be meaningful if it leads to a real substantial use of clawback and not to use this kind of hiding over so as to say that we have reduced it. So a first uh, proposal is that any kind of negotiations, which are welcome, but they should become at the level of rebate. Clawback should say outside. For those who are knowledgeable of the field, this is very well understood. The state must view that. Otherwise, we will be led to some kind of creative accounting. We have seen that in the past. In the future, we should avoid at any cost bad practice of the future. And in order to complement, and I say that for the audience following here, that means that we should finance uh, properly the needs that come from the public sector. So reduction of global on one hand, but also on the other hand, as uh, Madame Jacques have said, the public expenditure is stable for so many years. So we must view the real needs, be it uh, health services or whatever. And this must be done in a very systematic way from the state. Yes, let me also add, and I will agree and say that what we call clawback and rebate, along with the taxes we pay, needs to a 70% taxation of the industry. This one can well understand. This is something easy to grasp, what that means for our sector. So it's crystal clear. We can't, hey, we can't have a 70% taxation and uh, ask simultaneously for coverage of the patients and investment in RD. So we must demand a dramatic drop of this overtaxation. It can't be dubbed otherwise. As an industry, we should ask to have at least a 30% drop in this taxation, as it happens in other European countries. It's the only way to have both coverage of patients and also uh, make Greece uh, a research hub in southeastern Europe. We have all the perspectives and appropriate instruments. But we must do away with this counter incentive. This is crystal clear. And it has been discussed at the level of prime minister's cabinet. It has been understood. So we must see some immediate results over the next two years. I thank you all. I have pointed out. Everything has been uh, noted down. Your proposals are crystal clear and must be taken seriously into consideration. My personal opinion is that in such uh, um, 
measures that they should be taken, such uh, we have a delay in taking these rational uh, measures. And I speak, of course, uh, with regard to the state, to the government. With all that, the RRF and the new programs offer this possibility to exploit, that is, both your proposals and the creation, uh, data recording, integration of digitization of uh, health and the whole of public administration. I cannot uh, offer any more time. The next session must be launched. I warmly thank you. And I was glad to see you and see you again. Arrivederci.